All right, our next guest speaker, uh, and then we'll take some questions, uh, both David and, and he will take some questions, is Commander B.J. Armstrong. Uh, I welcome him back because, uh, doc actually, Dr. Commander B.J. Armstrong. Uh, B.J. is the most prolific author today in, on active duty, bar none, and I look forward to B.J.'s talk. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming today, both those of you here in live action and virtually. And I'd like to thank Claude and the USNA Museum team for putting this on today. It it's, takes work to put something like this together, so can we give them a round of applause, please? I've got one last thank you to make, and that's to the editors of the forthcoming book, Strategy Strikes Back, which is available for pre-order from Potomac Books and am on Amazon, comes out in the spring, all about how Star Wars helps illustrate modern military affairs. Um, part of my remarks today come from the chapter that I wrote for that book. And then I have a caveat. Uh, my caveat is that uh, my remarks today are based on what we historians call the visual and oral record. I'm going to be discussing some elements of Star Wars and the television series The Expanse based on what I've seen on the screen, not the textual analysis of massive amounts of literature that have been developed on both of these subjects. Um, so for those of you who are gigantic fans of that body, my apologies in advance. <laughs> and along those lines, I'd like to dedicate my comments today in the memory of Captain Owen Thorpe, USN PhD, on whose couch much research was conducted while I was a young midshipman. <laughs> So in the climactic moments of the Battle of Hoth, the vast majority of the Rebel Alliance's forces slipped through the fingers of the Galactic Empire. At the Battle of Yavin, small fighters overcame the defenses of the Death Star in order to strike the design weakness that made it vulnerable. Repeatedly, a small freighter called the Millennium Falcon and its core crew of leadership of the Rebel Alliance escaped what appear to be overwhelming Imperial odds. These developments in the galactic struggle between the Empire and the Rebel Alliance have been ascribed to luck by some, or to the influence of an ancient religion by others. However, such events do not require supernatural explanation. Instead, in military and naval terms, the result, the result of strategic choices and decisions made about the architecture of the Imperial fleet. These events were the natural outcome of Imperial leadership's nearly exclusive and myopic view that the importance for space fleets is large space battles and the platforms necessary for those space battles, while ignoring the strategic role of fleets in constabulary duties and the space security operations in times of relative peace. So from long, long ago to the present day and a century into the future in the case of Expanse, Naval and space forces have struggled to understand these roles. The officers commanding space forces and those developing fleet policy have a tendency to focus nearly all of their attention on the most physically dangerous element of their job, ship on ship and squadron in squadron battle. The result of this focus is that policy work on fleet design and force architecture attempts to address only a single question. What type of force is needed to seize the initiative and dominate another fleet in battle. Now this question is certainly important, but it should not be the only issue considered when developing acquisition plans and operational concepts for a fleet. This was particularly true of the Imperial fleet, which, was, which served to enforce the will of the Emperor and the dictates of the Imperial governors, regardless of whether the Empire was in open warfare or in relative peace. It also illustrated in a comparison between the UN fleet and the forces of the Martian Congressional Republic in the Expanse television series. Now discussions of fleet design benefit from an examination of the history of planetary naval strategy and operations. Naval forces have long played a central role in the power of states in both peacetime and in war. The necessity for fleets during conflicts between nations or political groups which span maritime environments seems obvious to us today. The ability to establish command of the sea or control of the oceans could be leveraged into the ability to cross those nautical divides and project force on an enemy. 
Over the course of history, it was determined that the best way to achieve the dominance that this fleet needed to achieve was to sweep the enemy's resistance from the sea. One of the struggles that strategists encounter with this ideal, however, is that once the maritime environment was claimed by a single competitor, resistance from ashore rarely stops. And instead, a different set of forces and a different set of operational concepts are needed to project the power needed for victory. So we've already discussed here today the operational history of the Battle of Hoth, and I'm going to take a slightly different view of things as opposed to our last presenter, or at least as opposed to the way the Empire's official historians <laughs> document <laughs> that event. At Hoth, there was no enemy for the fleet to engage and no question of who dominated the space environment within the system. Yet, the strike force assembled was made up exclusively of large 40,000 man star destroyers or larger ships. They were designed to engage in combat with other large vessels. The result of this force architecture was that the Rebel Alliance easily spotted the Imperial arrival, not because of the proximity at which they came out of hyperspace, but instead because of the size and shape of a force of <laughs> massive dreadnought battleships that simply could not be missed. <laughs> Within the Hoth system, the Star Destroyers attempted to establish a blockade, but the small number of large ships, susceptible to the anti-access weapons like the Rebels' ion cannon, were unable to effectively maneuver <laughs> and capture a fleeing fleet of small craft. The base on Hoth was destroyed, surely, which resulted in Imperial tactical success. Yet nearly the entire Rebel force was able to escape, giving them the strategic victory because of their continued survival. Without smaller combatants to enforce the blockade and run intercept operations, the small escaping transports and fighters and small craft, the blockade was simply a dismal failure, and therefore the Rebel Alliance actually wins. Success by squadrons of stunt fighters against the Death Star in the earlier Battle of Yavin also Im uh, illustrate a similar issue of balance in the Imperial force. Now, in some ways, misconceptions over fleet architecture necessary for success for command of space versus the need to, excess, to, the need to exercise the control those forces can create are to be expected. Placing first priority on the initial element of space strategy, that is, the ability to win the battle to start the war, clearly makes sense. However, moving beyond combat and the responsibilities of ships and squadrons within battles, the Imperial Fleet's force design almost completely ignores their second and equally important set of missions, operations and fleet responsibilities in peacetime. Particularly within the authoritarian political construct of the Imperial government, the ability of a fleet to transition to constabulary duties during peace during portions without direct conventional opponents is vital. Yet a force made up almost exclusively of large dreadnought star destroyers and super star destroyers, which are carriers augmented only with stunt sized fighters, produced a fleet that struggled to effectively execute constabulary missions. Much of the Imperial Strike Force at Hoth, dem much as the Imperial Strike Force at Hoth, demonstrates that small numbers of large combatants are ineffective in close blockade operations. Large numbers of small ships are also needed and more effective at the patrol missions and constabulary operations needed to establish security in large sections of space. With a fleet designed almost exclusively for squadron and fleet level combat and authority over huge sectors of space, the, the Empire had no real chance of keeping up with the space insecurity that was about to develop. The result is that large sections of space, including almost all of the outer rim systems, devolved into safe havens for smugglers, pirates, and illicit droid merchants. This is an environment of space insecurity, and it has enormous, it's an enormous area that lacked Imperial patrol. This is exactly the perfect environment for a rebel alliance to grow. With a fleet design that limited their ability to conduct constabulary operations, there was little that the empire could do about that. 
Now, despite the common perception that fleets are only needed for war, governments introduced risk to the peace when they focused their fleet only on large battleships. The insecurity that spread through the galaxy following the emperor's seizure of power was as much a result of their improper fleet architecture and force design as it was a sign of political resistance. The leaders of the Imperial fleet desperately sought the glory of squadron battles which their predecessors in the Clone Wars and other conflicts had had. But they were blind to the challenge they actually faced and the security requirements that the fleet had to execute. Now these observations on fleet space, or space fleets are not limited to the galactic struggles of the Star Wars universe. Closer to home and not quite so long, long ago, the interplanetary conflict in the Expanse television series gives hints of similar tensions in fleet design and balance in maritime forces. In the case of the Expanse, a comparison between the forces and operating methods of the UN fleet and the forces of the Martian Congressional Republic are admittedly a little bit harder because the visual and oral records available for analysis are less clear. But there are hints in this conflict but on that focus between fleet combat and the need for constabulary duties within the solar system. The UN fleet that we glimpse in the first two episodes of the, or the first two seasons of the Expanse is a fleet that historically would be called a naval power rather than a sea power. The fleet is focused on large ships like the Nathan Hale, which we see here, and operations are viewed from Earth as being dominated by the potential for war and fleet on fleet battles. UN Marines are used primarily for large-scale assault forces like the incident at Anderson Station. Martian forces appear to be more classically defined as a sea power. The Martian Congressional Republic's fleet includes large dreadnought battleships like the Doniger seen here, but it also has a capable or I'm sorry, the Doniger which is capable of fleet engagements although admittedly may be vulnerable to asymmetric attacks. But in the series, we repeatedly see the expansive use of small combatants throughout the episodes. Clearly, the most recognizable of these is the Tashi, which the Canterbury survivors rechristen as the Razanante, which is that ship there. But there's a number of others encountered both in the Jupiter theater and from the home squadron. We see battleships, in the Martian Navy, but we also see patrol destroyers, we see corvettes, and we see stealth intelligence collection. The Martian Congressional Republic recognizes that it's existentially connected to space. It is reliant on imports and it is reliant on trade for the continued survival of their Martian settlements. As a result, it does not ignore the constabulary duties of a Navy and Marine Corps. The first two seasons, we see MCRN boarding operations, blockade enforcement, small unit landing operations by the MCR Marines, and we see vessel shadowing and intelligence collection. As the Razanante moves through the solar system in its irregular operations, the threat of interception is far greater from the Martian Republic than it is from Earth's forces. And this is because the Martians see themselves as a space power as opposed to a military power. Now in these brief observations about fleet operations and Star Wars and the Expanse, the paradox of fleet design has become readily visible. There is a tension between the need to maintain a battle fleet ready for, to engage in the decisive squadron and fleet level engagements. But there's also the need to impose space security and effectively use the space control that achieve, can be achieved by navies. During multiple engagements in space battles, from the Clone Wars to the Battle of the Endor system, the Imperial fleet demonstrated skill and capability in large fleet engagements. And they developed the ability to conduct deep space squadron level operations. However, once the Empire gained control of the galaxy, the fleet design constructed around these large battle fleets became a hindrance to their galactic constabulary responsibilities. In the Expanse, the, UN's fleet, the UN fleet's focus on large ships has a similar effect. Lacking constabulary forces or those actively conducting patrol operations in the solar system, 
appears to have left Earth well behind the Martians in their ability to gather information on and understand what is happening in the belt and the threats that approach. Now, the observations from these science fiction universes do not necessarily prove anything to us. <laughs> they are fiction. <laughs> Instead, at their root, whether, the, their, whether it's intended by the screenwriters, authors, and producers or not, they offer illustrations of foundational concepts from our naval past. Alfred Thayer Mahan, Philip Cullum, Sir Julian Corbett, once they got over, of course, the moving images and the talking at them from the screen, they would easily recognize the strategic and operational challenges of the construction and deployment of a balanced fleet, whether long, long ago or a century in the coming future. Thank you. Scares me. That's a bad idea. Not on the record. <laughs> Questions. First of all, that was Tourette's when I spit out nozzles. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. So, so I had a question for you. So to, to flip things around, you, you had this focus on the Imperials. I wanted to know your thoughts, maybe briefly, on any kind of parallel between the Rebel Alliance and their use on, you know, with snub fighters and the Pacific Fleet in the wake of Pearl Harbor as you know, the mainline ships were mostly taken out. Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting parallel to draw. Um, I think what we see from the Rebel Alliance is in part their fleet architecture is based on different limitations in the Empire, right? Financial limitations, what kind of ships they can get from the, the planets that are part of the Alliance. And so they end up with a uh, design that is much uh, broader, much more balanced. And therefore, they can, when they have losses, respond by doing things differently. Um, I think your example of the US Navy in the early months of World War II in the Pacific uh, is, is an illustration of what happens when you don't have the, the force that is larger and balanced. You can't respond very quickly to the ability to, uh, to try and fight in a different way. Um, so you see the example of not just the loss at Pearl Harbor, but the loss of the Asiatic fleet uh, around the Philippines as well, which is um, older ships, perhaps a more balanced fleet, but also one that uh, could have been used to, um, to try and counter Japanese advances within the islands in a different way, but that's gone also. Um, although, you know, arguably the reality is the two ocean navy it simply needed time to be built in World War II, and it was coming already anyway, so the parallel kind of starts to fall apart. Well, is the live stream up? Because we're getting texts from people who are saying it's not. There's it still stuff. Patriot League, Patriot League is working on it. They can also access Facebook Live, Naval Academy Museum site. OK. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Patrick. Patrick. So David, question for you. Yeah. Uh, you. You gave us some great, bad examples leadership from the empire, but I find it difficult to discern good examples of leadership from the rebel alliance. <laughs> right, so the, I think the, 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 the microphone. I think the, I, I think the uh, failures of the empire well outweigh uh, the, the failures of the rebel alliance. I think what the rebel alliance did very well was uh, it, it was you know it was scrappy it was in a lot of ways disaggregated and hodgepodge but everybody that's that's bedeviled the United States for the last 20 years are sim are, are in a similar boat um, the Taliban we constantly kill their leadership but they're they're like a they're like a like a like, you know, they're like a yeah, hydra. If you cut off one head, another one pops right back up, and that's sort of the nature of rebellions, which is why you want to lead the galaxy in a way that maybe gives people a stake uh, in in their government and in their in the way that they uh, in, in in how they relate to their you know their their government. And I think that's kind of the issue with uh, the 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 empire and the emperor and his leadership style is. It's ultimately his weaknesses more than the Rebel Alliance's uh, uh, shortcomings that, that ultimately sort of bring them down. Well, speaking as a writer, it doesn't hurt to 
plot be with you. <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. <laughs> Yes. An aviator or two has made a mistaken judgment on yes. the West Coast. Yes. <laughs> uh, the Ford shuffle, right? the Ford shuffle will reverberate. How right. will you write about that? I mean, will you be digging into the amplification of what happened? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I have opinions about this, and I will not be shy of sharing them. I, I think that. Um, I don't have all the facts, right? Uh, but I will say that I think, that, I, I believe anyway, given my four years at Navy Times, that uh, that there is a concern about a zero defect mentality. It, it was not easy to pull off what that guy pulled off. I mean, I'm not an aviator. <laughs> 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 But, uh, but all that to say, so I, I would worry about going down too hard on that guy or coming down too hard on that guy because I, I, I would worry that that would be a, an overreaction to the crime. Go ahead. David, remember that in uh, Star Trek Next Generation, right. we had five Starfleet Academy pilots try to cold war Starbird, and we're all relieved except for Wesley Crusher for that commitment. That's right. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an admiral. I'm just an observer. But first of all, <laughs> it was funny. Uh, <laughs> so, Second of all, I understand. And second of all, I wonder. I, I am concerned that the reaction that the Navy is having, which I, you know, I don't know what they are doing, but I, there was a, a statement from a three star yesterday. I mean, I, I think that that's starting to get out of proportion for what actually happened. The guy pulled off a prank, a funny one, and one that upset some of the locals and some of the neighbors. And I'm sure the Navy was embarrassed because it went everywhere. It's social media gold, right? But coming down too hard on that pilot for pulling off a pretty tricky maneuver, um, I, I think sets a bad example. And I think it's a reaction to the Harvey Wein uh, Weinstein and Kevin Spacey and Al Franken and all the things that are in the news right now around sexual misconduct that any suggestion that that might be going on in the Navy must be crushed. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's probably an overreaction. But again, I don't know all the facts. Maybe they dug into it and this guy was – was some deviant that was <laughs> preying on his air crew or something. I don't know. Uh, you can go back. Then. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> in, in regards to the expanse, um, you, you, know, you have the Martians who have been Storytelling perspective, it might it might be convenient to have this sort of like giant super nation force. But you know, speaking from firsthand experience, and I'm sure you know all the people who have served in joint and uh, and uh, multinational environments, it can be difficult to say the least to uh, coordinate with other nations who may have different um, doctrines, who may have different operating procedures. So um, you know, speaking into, into the matter of <coughs> fleet composition and fleet mission, um, how how would you I guess, what would your comment be on how the Expanse handles that with sort of a multinational force uh, coming to the United States? That's a good, that's a good question. I think, uh, as a historian, I have to start by saying that the evidence is scarce to be able to address that in terms of the visual and oral record, as I discussed. Having not read the books, I can't really talk about you know, what's in those. It appears from the television program that the UN is operating as a world government uh, as opposed to what we know of as the UN today. Uh, in that way, I, I do expect uh, a, a thought out fleet design if they are one world government. Um, now you raise an interesting point, right? And that is, you know, if they're not, if it's more of a partnership operation, then what, what do partnerships, what have they brought to naval forces in the past? And, and there's a lot of recent literature uh, in strategic studies discussing the importance of partnerships, how partnerships are, how we will fight in the future, except if we look back at Java Sea, if we look back at the French and Spanish force at Trafalgar, we see lots of examples of partnership operations that don't play out well in combat. Um, and so in many ways, partnership might be more valuable to the smaller force that's partnering than the bigger force that is partnering with someone. Uh, 
Um, the historical example I would use from that will take from First Lieutenant Bratton's discussion, and that is in the Barbary War, where the United States Navy actually did rely a great deal on support from the Royal Navy in terms of basing and supplies and things like that. It's not discussed very much in our history of the Barbary War because we like to be the, um, the sole American force that comes in and saves Europe from these terrorist pirates. Um, and that's a terrible narrative and completely false. Um, but it's the one that we like to cling to. Um, do you, looking at the, uh, the, the setup of the, uh, the fleet forces for the empire, uh, where they are geared towards, a con towards that next big uh, conventional ship-to-ship -ship conflict, whereas you have the Imperial Army that's more geared uh, towards planetary constabulary forces, as you see on Tatooine, do you think that the, the disconnect between the Imperial Army and Imperial Navy sort of echoes the disconnect of, you know, uh, to go back to World War II, between the US Navy and the US Army at the beginning of the war that they had to figure out who owned what in the Pacific? Like if this, if, if this touches water, it's owned by the Navy. If it touches land, it's owned by the Army. So I, I think that's, it's a good question. The, um, I'm not sure that I would quite classify the Galactic Army or galactic land forces in that way. I mean, I think one of the scenes um, from Rogue One kind of demonstrates that, where heavily armored troops with tanks trying to move through confined uh, urban areas, that doesn't suggest a force designed for constabulary missions to me. That, design, uh, that suggests a force designed for large conventional operations that's being used in a constabulary way. Um, and so I don't know that it actually connects. I think that actually illustrates um, the, the Imperial Army is just as bad as the Imperial Fleet uh, at understanding what the challenges it truly faces are. Uh, maybe if they had an Imperial Marine Corps, they would have been doing better. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, please hang on. Let, let him finish. Sir, would you say that what would be your opinion on this? Would you say that to some degree what we might be set up with the same trap and that we're looking back at World War II and still wanting to fight those same large scale naval battles, even though that might not be the current um, environment? I think the question that you have asked is a fundamental question to the Navy in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, how today's Navy pursues uh, fleet architecture and the design of the fleet. Um, you know, if you look at the recent official Navy documents that have been put out, they have suggested continuing to build as many large surface combatants and capital ships as possible. And I include high expense submarines in that category. Um, there's not a whole lot of discussion as to whether or not, uh, say, the modern equivalent of a Garing class destroyer would be useful today. You know, we look at a 1,200 ton ship today and, and most naval officers kind of shrug their shoulders and say, I don't want to command that. Now the reality is they'd be lieutenant commanders commanding it and they'd love to have command, right? And so, I mean, that's another, and that's part of what I actually have written about in, in the larger book chapter that's, that's in that Star Wars book that's coming out is there's also leadership uh, ramifications of having a fleet that's dominated by 40,000 man ships with captains who assume command at the end of their careers instead of ever experiencing leadership earlier on. So there, it's not just combat, but there's also cultural ramifications for the Navy and leadership ramifications for the Navy in looking towards large ships almost in exclusion. Time for one more quick question. Uh, yes, 
comprise of species from across the galaxy, and their leadership being from species across the galaxy, like Pamela Akbar being the Mount Calamari. Mm -hmm. Would that be a fair assessment to say that that's why we succeeded in the Revolutionary War was because our leadership was local, understood the local terrain against the giant empire at the time, and much like the rebellion leadership, their leadership was local and knew all the broad terrains that the empire did not have that kind of home-based knowledge. Yeah, so I think this speaks to the point that I made about strategy being important and in terms of the, the leadership strategy empo employed by uh, Emperor Palpatine. Uh, again, it all goes back to dissolving the Imperial Senate for me. Um, when you do that, you disenfranchise a broad swath of people. You make it, anybody that's not on board with the Emperor's agenda is then all of a sudden a malcontent. And, oh, where, is there a convenient outlet for my, my grievances with the Emperor? Oh, yeah, there's this well-equipped and at least somewhat organized rebel alliance that I can hop on board with and maybe I can strike a few blows or blow up a Death Star or two. Um, I, I think that that, that, that is uh, the problem that you run into, right? I mean, uh, whenever you have a big bad enemy, this is, uh, you know, I'll, I don't wanna, I don't wanna get too far down the lane of comparing the rebel alliance to ISIS, but this is kind of what ISIS did well, right? <laughs> Uh, and, and I think Matthew would probably agree, um, because I've seen his Twitter feed. But um, <laughs> but the uh, but the uh, but but this is what ISIS did well. Look at this big bad enemy. Uh, people aggrieved peoples all across the world. Um, then they you know obviously tactically they haven't really been as good as they were uh, you know strategically in terms of recruiting. But ultimately, they did recruit from a broad swath of aggrieved people because they said, hey, you're disenfranchised, you're not getting a stake, you're, uh, you're discriminated against in this country and that country and the, the other country. And so yeah, when you, when you create grievances and as a leader, and Emperor Palpatine certainly did that in a number of ways, you do create a broad swath of disenfranchised and aggrieved people that you can recruit to an extreme cause that the Rebel Alliance uh, <laughs> represents, I guess, in this chat. Thank you, gentlemen. Yep.